The Engelmeyer Puppets by Mary Danby And takes for the masses, how exhilarating, drawled Sir William Porter Grant, pointing across the marketplace. Come along, Gwendolyn, we'll see what it's all about. Above the entrance to the old corn exchange hung a large notice. Castle Fenton Annual Antiques Fair, open daily, Sundays included, 10 till 6, running March 30th to April 12th. Gwen Portergrant followed her son across the square. Weighted down with two full bags of groceries, she would rather have made for the car park, or fullers perhaps, for a cup of tea and a slice of walnut layer cake. But William wanted to see the antiques. Inside the corn exchange, thirty or so stalls were arranged around the sides of the vast inner hall, with a block of a further ten in the centre. There were displays of china and glass, jewellery, bric-a-brac, pictures, books, dolls and fans, along with a few small pieces of furniture. Gwen Porter Grant saw a rather nice high-backed tapestry chair and wondered if they might buy it for the top landing. At least she could try it out and take the load off her feet for a while. But William was pulling her away, telling her there were some dueling pistols on the next stall and if she didn't hurry up he'd buy one and shoot her with it. He laughed his noisiest laugh then and one or two people turned to look. Gwen smiled weakly and pretended to be busy with her shopping bags. William was tall for sixteen, with freckled skin, a large heavy featured face and a mop of pale yellow hair. He was a little like his father had been, only much coarser. Those pale, slightly hooded eyes held none of the twinkling warmth that Gwen had so loved in her late husband Gerald. Dear sweet Jerry, he had been her life. But the war had come, a huge obscuring cloud which stayed six years, then moved away, and when the skies were clear again, Gerald Porter Grant was gone, blown apart like a dandelion clock on Monte Cassino, leaving his young wife with a four-year-old son and a large bleak mansion on an unfashionable hillside to the west of Doncaster. Marlin's the house was called, but there were those who, romantically connecting it with the Arthurian legend, insisted it had once been Merlin's. There was, however, no evidence for this, apart from a small section of the surrounding wall, which apparently dated from the 7th century. The rest of the house was about 200 years old, a severe granite mausoleum, cold in all seasons. William had inherited house, property and baronetcy, although the first two were held in trust for him by his mother, until he would reach the age of 21. In five years then he would have everything and she nothing except such bounty as he might generously confer on her. His favourite threat was to cut her off without a penny, leaving her homeless and struggling for survival on her war widow's pension. And he would be quite capable of that, she told herself, wondering where she had gone wrong with his upbringing. Heaven knows she had tried, it wasn't easy without a father. He had moved on now to another stall where he was inspecting a china figurine of a dancer captured in mid-pirouette. It was a pretty thing and Gwen would have liked it for her mantelpiece, but William would not want such frippery. Even now he was just idling with it, turning it around on his hand. There was a sudden hush as the figurine fell and shattered on the wooden floor. William raised his eyebrows and looked down at the broken dancer. A shame, such a shame, he said, not looking too unhappy. The stallkeeper hurried around tutting. It'll have to be paid for, he said. Just like it says, he indicated a postcard which read, Please do not touch, all breakages must be paid for. Oh dear, said Gwen, how much do you want? Before the storekeeper could answer, William had given his mother a sharp kick on the ankle. Let's go, Gwendolyn, shall we? 
he said haughtily. The storekeeper caught hold of his sleeve. Just a minute, he said. You haven't paid. Paid? What for? William shook his arm free. That coy little knick-knack, not worth tuppence. Besides, it fell by itself. You must have moved the table. It was a messine, argued the storekeeper, and you dropped it. Anyway, what about the notice? All breakages must be paid for. William sniggered. I dare say they must, but not by me. Try the Salvation Army. They're usually good for a touch. I don't know who you think you are, young man, the storekeeper said sternly. I'm William, Sir William Porter Grant, which is more than you'll ever be, sneered the boy. Listening to this exchange was a tall, thin man with a chalk-white face and steel-rimmed spectacles. He moved forward now and introduced himself to William and Gwen. You may like to know that I am Julius von Bick, he said with a stagely strong Viennese accent. William, taken off guard, merely stared, his mouth slack with surprise. If you would like to step over here, went on von Bick, I will show you something which may be more to your taste, perhaps. That wouldn't be difficult, said William, recovering himself. Gwen whispered, I'm so sorry to the owner of the figurine, and reached into her handbag for her purse with the object of slipping him a few pounds. But William saw and tugged her roughly away. Oh, really, Gwendolyn, you're so wet, he said under his voice. Gwen smiled her weak smile. She should stand up to him, of course, tell him when his schoolboy humour went too far, but she was afraid to. He could be so cutting, and she hated the way he called her Gwendolyn in that pointedly refined fashion. Mother was so much more pleasant. Von Bick led them to a stall in the corner where the light was not too good, and they had to come quite close to see that the items on display were toys. Side by side on a table stood a model fort, a peg top, a wooden engine, a kaleidoscope and a clockwork clown. Do look, said Gwen, picking up a ragdoll. I used to have one just like this, only with black hair. William tested the wheels of a hobby horse. Its head was made of calico, and it was beginning to split at the seams. He pulled some of the stuffing out, gave Von Bick a defiant smirk, and lobbed the stuffing into the fort. Well, he said, where's this thing I'm supposed to be so interested in? If the man objected to William's behaviour, he gave no sign. With quiet politeness, he said, please wait, and pushed forward a tall wooden box-like structure. It was a puppet theatre. Oh, Punch and Judy, said William in a bored voice. Not at all, replied Von Bick. What I am showing you is a puppet theatre which once belonged to an Austrian duke. His palace was famous for its entertainments and his puppeteers second to none. Look, please, at the workmanship. The theatre was richly covered with oil paintings depicting clowns and ballerinas, dragons and demons, fairies and sorcerers. On either side of the proscenium arch were columns of acrobatic cherubs delicately gilded. Beautiful, breathed Gwen. It's quite beautiful. But then the Austrians are marvellous at this sort of thing. She had spent one summer near Innsbruck practising her German. She felt something of an expert. Beautiful, she said again. Belong to a duke, eh? mused William, obviously impressed. Von Bick disappeared and a few seconds later emerged from the back of the theatre with a painted box. The players, he explained, opening the box and removing two puppets. They have performed before many a king and queen, haven't you, my little friends? Mein kleinen Freund. He made the puppets nod their heads. One of them, which von Bick called Herr Professor, was not unlike himself, lean and grey with precariously balanced spectacles. He was born in Salzburg, said von Bick, 
and was educated in the great universities of Europe, a fellow of refinement, of great sensibility. Well, well, bully for him, said William, and this year lady is the widow Volgenboer, von Bick went on. See how she loves her fine clothes, charming is she not? Frau Volgenbauer was getting on in years, but elegant, with her silver hair drawn back into a large bun. Her dress was made of purple taffeta, which rustled as she moved. Like Herr Professor, she was a rod puppet, a jointed doll held up by a stick attached to her back, with arms moved by thin rods fixed to her wrists. She is a bon vivo, said von Bick and her musical evenings, her salons, are attended by the most celebrated music lovers in Vienna. William said, How quaint! Gwen, looking round, saw that the hall was almost empty. A few stallholders were packing away their antiques. The rest had left. Six o'clock, she said to William, we ought to be going. Do be quiet, Gwendolyn, he replied. She felt he, too, would have wanted to leave if only it hadn't been her who'd suggested it. No, he'd stay till they were thrown out just to upset her. What else have you got in there? William was asking Von Bick. A jolly-looking, gaily-dressed character was introduced next. Rollo the Jester wore the traditional cap and bells costume, and his face was painted with a merry grin. A lover of gladness, a friend to the children, the maker of smiles, they were told. Beneath him in the box were Hedwig, a beautiful blonde peasant girl, as sweet and pure as the mountain flowers, and Hans, a smart young soldier, upright of bearing and character. He loves but one girl, his little Hedwig, explained Vodvik, and I placed them side by side in the box so. Why do you make up stories about them? asked William. I mean, they're only puppets. Von Bick clutched the box to his waistcoat. Only puppets, he said slowly with exaggerated astonishment. Oh, no, young man. They are more alive than most of the people you see around you. More alive than you or me, perhaps. You think I'm pretending? You think... This poor old fool, he is in dotage. He can't tell dollars from human beings. If you were Austrian, I would say. These puppets were made by the hands of Engelmeyer himself, the greatest of all puppet makers. And you would recognise and bow the head. But you are an English nobleman, barren in your mind, and you say pooh to anything you cannot understand. William Gifford. Pooh, then, he said jauntily. Pooh, I say. Hear that, Gwendolyn? Got a bit of cheek, hasn't he, for someone who's trying to sell something? It does not matter, said Von Bick. You will buy? Yeah, who says? What do I want with a puppet theatre, anyway? You will buy, because the price is just one guinea. And you will say to yourself, my goodness, it must be worth a lot more. I will buy it and sell it again for a big, big profit. William frowned. One guinea? You had to be crazy. Why so cheap, eh? Stolen, is it? Von Bick shook his head. One guinea is all we want, he said softly. William, chuckling to himself over the possibility of making easy money out of the senile naivety of an old man, didn't notice the plural, but took a pound from his wallet and a shilling from his pocket and handed them over. Smiling quietly, Von Vick folded up the theatre and placed the lid on the box of puppets, murmuring as he did so as if bidding farewell to his friends. In a short time, William and Gwen, together with their bargain, were driving away from Castle Fenton in their open-topped Alvis Tourer on the road to Marlins. Since the war, Gwendolyn had been unable to find any living staff, and she relied solely on a part-time gardener and a cleaning lady, who cycled the four miles from the nearest hamlet twice a week. It was a struggle, and many of the rooms at Marlin's were now closed and dust-sheeted. 
The games room, however, was kept clean and relatively warm, as William spent a great deal of his time there in the school holidays, playing chess with a correspondent in Edinburgh and cheating against himself at snooker. The puppet theatre had been erected in one corner. It had not been touched since the day they had brought it home, and the paintings on the sides seemed to glow less richly, while the gold of the cherubs was dulled by dust. A good investment, William had declared. We'll keep it a while, then sell it for an enormous sum. And the Engelmeyer puppets seem to be collector's pieces too. I looked them up. Perhaps Sotheby's would be interested. It was the fifth week of the summer holidays when at breakfast, a grim appetite-killing time with William glowering into his cereal bowl, at Gwen's suggestions for the day's activities, the subject of the theatre was raised again. "'What will you do today, dear?' Gwen asked her son. She glanced towards the window at the wet slates on the stable roof. "'Too wet to go out. What a pity!' William grunted. Gwen pleaded with her mind for ideas. She couldn't bear those days when he sat around nagging her or criticising as she went about her household tasks. He never offered to help, and she never liked to ask him. She suspected she had spoilt him, but there it would be wrong to add to the burdens of a fatherless child. "'I know,' she said at last, swallowing a mouthful of toast. "'There's that old puppet theatre. Why not have a go with that? See if you can work the puppets. You could put on a little show.' In reply, William snorted disdainfully, but later she heard him in the games room talking in funny voices. Smiling to herself as she imagined him in childlike play, she pushed open the door. Immediately, William appeared from behind the theatre. "'Why don't you shove off and get lost?' he said nastily. Then a gleam came into his eyes. "'Right, right then, you've done it now.' This time you've really done it. She didn't know what he meant, but it was plain something unpleasant was in store for her. And he may be my son, she later confided to the cleaning lady, as they drank tea together in the kitchen. But sometimes I do believe I could throttle him. Shortly she was summoned from the kitchen by a shout from the games room. Come on then, Gwendolyn, we haven't got all day. If you want your little show, you'll jolly well have to buck up. I'm starting now. With a look that was half apprehension, half resignation, she did as she was told and made her way to the games room. Inside, she found the curtains drawn and the theatre lit by a bare bulb, hanging from the ceiling just above it. She seated herself on the chair provided and waited. After a few moments, William's voice came through the front of the theatre below the stage. You are about to see a puppet show, an intimate review, he gave a dry laugh. Kindly do not utter remarks during the performance. Gwen shifted in her seat. She was aware that this would be no goody two-shoes, but she was quite unprepared for the characters now paraded for her between the gilt cherubs. An odd little chuckle preceded the appearance of Herr Professor, that dapper intellectual, but he was now a filthy tramp, rolling drunkenly about, spitting curses and obscenities. He looked as if he had been smeared with dirt and trampled on. His spectacles were misshapen and lopsided. At last, with a good bleeding bite, he brought the stream of hate to an end. Oh dear, oh, how dreadful, exclaimed Gwen as the puppet dipped out of sight. Immediately William's voice said, Quiet, how can I do this show if you keep talking? Poor Frau Vogelbauer came next. Her purple taffeta dress was a mass of tears and her hair was wild and witch-like. She began to croak out a song in a coarse, cockney voice. It was about death and putrefaction, disease and defecation. It was completely disgusting. 
At the end, she cackled loud and long, but it wasn't funny. It was revolting, humiliating even. Stop it, William, called out Gwen in what was almost a shout. You mustn't do this. It's wrong, terribly wrong. She's supposed to be a lady, a fine, elegant person. Mr. Von Bick said so. You're hurting her. Architect, cackled Frau Valgelberger. She ought to shut her mouth if she knows what's good for her. Be left without a farthing else. Another cackle and the puppet retired. The jester was vile, a sneering, sleazy individual. Oozing insincerity, William had altered his mouth somehow, so that it was no longer grinned merrily, but was set in a loathsome leer. He was made to crack a couple of lewd jokes which made Gwen wince. What was it Von Bick had said? A lover of gladness, a friend to the children. She would no more let this posturing vile creature near a child than she would a serpent. Hedwig, the peasant girl, came next together with her soldier boyfriend, Hans. By this time, William had given up trying to operate them as puppets and simply clutched each round the waist. Hi, gorgeous, he made Hedwig say through pouting ruby red lips. What to see what I got? All things to all men, I call it. You can have ten percent off now, seeing as how I'm a skipper of uniform. Hans did a little dance, and his handsome head wobbled from side to side. Whoops a daisy, he said. William made him wag a limp wrist as he chilled. I've got a someone crazy for me. He's funny that way. Twenty percent, offered Hedwig. Hands made as if to peer under her skirt, then bobbed up again. Now thanks, Ducky, you ain't got what it takes. Gwen felt dizzy and sick. She put her hands over her ears. Oh, do stop it, she begged, do stop it. The stage curtains were abruptly drawn. Seconds later, they swung back to reveal William's grinning head. Had enough, Gwendolyn, dear? he asked. Filthy. Gwen was muttering, unable to look at him. Degrading, immoral. Nauseating, suggested William. Well, dear, you did ask for it. For a puppet show, not for this, not for that horrifying performance. It upset her to think that William's head harboured such unpleasantness. Who had put it there? His fashionable public school? Surely not. Not at nearly a hundred pounds a term. You've spoilt it, she said. Those wonderful puppets, they were made to be loved and admired, to bring happiness and laughter. <laughs> Didn't you laugh then, said William. Oh, no, of course not. You've got no sense of humour. Personally, I thought they were hilarious. And you've ruined the puppets, Gwen went on. What will they be worth now with their clothes all spoiled and horrible muck on their faces? William shrugged. They look better to me. It gives them a bit of character. That nice Mr. Von Bick would be so upset if he knew, said Gwen, shaking her head. In answer, William made a rude noise, came out from behind the theatre and announced he was going off to shoot some rabbits. Gwen, in a delayed reaction to the assault on her senses, dissolved into tears. She cried for her husband, who had given her this child, this fiend of inhumanity, and left her to its bludgeoning. She wished for death as a merciful escape, knowing that life for her would never be anything but a vile torment. Howard Jones nosed his van along the narrow back street by the river. There it is, said his wife, Marilyn. At the end of the street was a dark little shop which seemed to grow out of the cobbled pavement, as if it had been there for centuries. Painted in a curve on the window were the words, Julius von Bick Antiques. Bill was right, Marilyn said, as Howard parked the van. This really is the back of nowhere. Bill Middleton was another dealer, a friendly rival, Marilyn called him. Only the friendliness was mostly on Bill's side. Right now, Marilyn was planning a mean little stab in the back. 
Are you sure you should? Herod was asking. It does seem a rotten thing to do. Look, said Marilyn, pushing the wisp of bleached hair back into its French plates. We haven't driven sixty miles to start having d doubts. Anyway, why should I care about Bill? This is business. He'd do the same to me. Last night at a party, Bill Middleton had said, I've just heard of a set of Engelmeyer puppets up Doncaster Way Theatre too. Think I'll take a look at them Thursday. Today was Wednesday, a dull, breezy day, cold for October. Marilyn made an elegant descent from the van. Do you have to lock it, she said petulantly, as Howard made the van secure. It's hardly likely to be stolen, and couldn't you have parked it a bit nearer? You know how I hate a cold wind. She pulled her jacket tightly around her and strode down the pavement towards the shop. As Howard caught up with her and they both stood peering into the dimness behind the window, she clutched his arm. Wow, she exclaimed, there it is, at the back seat. That's the theatre, all right. She tried the door of the shop, but it was locked. Oh, hell, she said. Early closing, suggested Howard. They started as a voice behind them said, You wish to see my theatre? There are puppets too, you know. Come and read them, please. They turned to see an old man fishing in his waistcoat pocket for a key. He unlocked the door and as they followed him inside, he said, But excuse me, I must introduce myself. My name is Julius von Bick. He waved an arm. My shop. Very nice, murmured Howard. Marilyn was admiring the theatre. Cherub's great, she was saying. Where did it come from? Von Bick described the theatre's history, the high life it had known as the plaything of princes. It was more recently the property of a young Englishman, he concluded. But sadly he was unable to continue his ownership. Then, ducking behind the theatre, Von Bick produced a box of puppets. Allow me to introduce my little friends, he said. Foul play was not ruled out, but there was no evidence to connect Gwen with murder, other than the remark she had confided to the cleaning lady on the eve of William's disappearance, that she wished him dead. Various theories were propounded about how he had gone for a midnight swim and drowned in the lake. They dragged the lake for days with no results about how he might accidentally have shot himself, but... No body was ever found. He had run away, some said, with a girl perhaps, added others. But as the weeks went by and there was no word, the police became bored with the case and moved on to more spicy investigations. Gwen bought herself some new clothes and attracted the eye of a local historian who paid a research visit to Marlin's while compiling a book on the area. Eventually, the courts agreed that the ownership of Marlin's and its contents and the rest of the family fortune, such as it was, should pass to Gwen. She promptly sold everything she could and removed herself and the historian to a warmer climate. But though Gwen Porter Grant thrived in her new life, there was a terrible secret she carried always with her. She never told a single soul, and if she had, no one would have believed her, except perhaps Julius von Bick. On the night of William's disappearance, she had awoken very suddenly. It seemed to her that she had just heard a terrible cry, a howl of pure terror. Sitting up in bed, though her ears and eyes straining in the darkness, she heard something else, the chatter of small, high voices. The noise was coming from below her, from the games room. She wondered whether she should wake William, but dreaded the fuss he always made if disturbed from his sleep. Instead, she pulled on her dressing gown and descended the stairs alone, carrying for protection a stiletto-heeled shoe. The door of the games room was ajar and she peeped inside. 
The rest was not quite real, but it wasn't a dream either. No, none of it seemed to make sense. What she saw, or thought she saw, was William completely naked, lying on the floor with the five puppets cavorting around him, their manipulating rods trailing about no man clattering against each other. William's chest and stomach were split open, but there was no blood, not even a trickle. He appeared to be empty. Perhaps his insides had been removed, only they were nowhere to be seen, and the puppets were stuffing him with little wads of kapok, which they were pulling out of an old velvet cushion. William seemed to be paralysed from the neck down, but his eyes were open, and, in obvious agony and horror, he was watching everything that was going on. At one point, his eyes swivelled desperately to the door where Gwen stood, mesmerised, unable to help him. The puppets were plainly enjoying themselves. Her professor began a sing-song chant, which the others joined in. Eins, zwei, drei, und die bist klein, sonst klein wie ein Pup sein. One, two, three, and you'll be small, now taller than a little doll. Frau Vogelbauer was holding aloft a needle and thread. She advanced on William, whose eyes contracted in fright. As she stabbed at his skin, he opened his mouth in a silent scream, and the others laughed delightedly, their voices tinkling like cowbells. As Frau Vogelberger stitched William, wincing each time, the needle entered his bloodless skin, seemed to shrink. Smaller and smaller he became, until by the time the thread was cut he was tiny, now bigger than a puppet. Then Herr Professor knelt over him, obscuring William's face, and Gwen heard him, issuing some sort of command. When he arose, William's expression was set firm, as if he had been carved from wood. The puppets danced a gleeful little dance around him, their rods clattering to macabre accompaniment. Willkommen, willkommen, they sang in hellish chorus, and their voices jarred and jangled through the night. It was a dream upset by William's puppet show the previous day. Gwen had had at least three scotches before dinner. She normally kept one. She might have known they would give her a nightmare. Please, please, could she wake up now and be safe upstairs in her bed? She fainted. When she woke up, she was in her bed and the sheets were damp with sweat. William's absence at breakfast was unremarkable, but when Gwen found his bed not slept in, and the empty cover of a velvet cushion left lying on the gown's room floor, she had to admit to herself that last night had perhaps been no dream. She took care to avoid the puppet theatre, and no power in hell could have persuaded her to touch the box of puppets. In due course she found Mr Von Bick's address, and arranged for the theatre and puppets to be returned to him. She felt it was the least she could do. Who's this then? added the man. Marilyn Jones, as Von Bick brought Hedrick out of the box. The little puppet looked demure and fresh, like the others she had been restored to her original beauty by the caring, sorrowing hands of Von Bick. This, said the old man, is little Hedwig. He, she is a simple peasant girl, as sweet and pure as the mountain flowers, and here is her soldier boyfriend, Hans. Perfect, declared Marilyn. Real angle now, without any doubt at all. Just look how finally their faces have been carved. Not unlike some of the early Czech puppets, don't you think? Julius von Bick inclined his head in acknowledgement. Marilyn went on to describe the puppets she had bought and sold, the Polish marionettes. The Fantoccini from Italy, Chinese shadow puppets, German glove puppets. 
Japanese Bunraku, Punch and Judy, Hans Burst and Caspel Guignol. That is so, said Von Dick, nodding. But these, Marilyn looked at Howard and laughed unattractively. Won't Bill be positively steaming when he finds out? How much? she asked Von Dick. Just Von Guinea, said the old man. Marilyn gave Howard a sharp nudge. He's crackers, she whispered. Out loud, she said, fine, yes, very fair. Right, we'll take the whole thing, theatre and all. Howard was peering into the puppet box. You've forgotten one, he said. Von Bick shrugged. Oh, he is not an Engelmeyer. This puppet had none of the charm of the others. Its flabby, pyjama-clad body was topped by a round, scowling face, startled grey eyes and a straggling lump of yellow hair. He is a nobleman, went on Von Bick, eyeing the puppet with distaste. A joke, yes? We'll have him too, said Marilyn. He looks a bit stupid, but we could say he is the pickle herring, the little buffoon. Has he a name? Von Bick nodded. He is called Wilhelm. As the last puppet was placed in the box, covering William's impassive wooden face, Von Bick murmured, Auf Wiedersehen, mein kleinen Freund. Come back soon, he whispered. Marilyn turned to Howard. We'll go on then, she said. Fetch the van. <laughs>